Buenos días. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I hope uh, you're not too damaged. After yesterday, I've heard rumors during the breakfast. And, uh, and, uh, and Ulrich has recommended me to take it slow. So uh, I will take his advice. Um, thank you first to the organization for inviting me. And, and, and above all, thank you for offering me your time during this morning. It is a, a, a real privilege to be here today and get to spend some time with you talking about what I consider to be a fascinating topic in football law. As you can see, is it the presentation on? Can we? I'm sorry. No, no there, there you go. OK, it's, I don't think this, it's not working. I apologize for this inconvenience. I don't know if something, somebody can give me a hand with it. Now, there we go. So, as uh, you can see, I chose this uh, beautiful picture of the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge because um, it represents, to me at least, better than anything, uh, the, the problems that we face when it comes to insolvency-related disputes uh, and football uncertainty. We know where we want to go. We want to cross the bridge, get to the other side, but we don't always know what lies ahead, whether we will find traffic jam, what speed we need to drive at, how long will it take. And something similar happens when we have an insolvent club in front of us. When we need to take action against an insolvent club in front of the FIFA legal bodies, we also know where we want to go. We want to get a favorable decision. We want to enforce it. If the club fails to comply to it, but we don't always know what surprises and obstacles we'll need, to, uh, we'll need to overcome and we'll need to sort out. And um, because when it comes to insolvency, the first thing or uh, the main thing you need to keep in mind is that the RSTP and the procedural rules of FIFA are exactly as the bridge behind me. They are foggy. But luckily for all of us, during the past nine years, the Court of Arbitration for Sport has not shied away from this problem, has stepped in and has offered us an incredible set of tools to help us navigate through this uncertainty. And those tools are precisely what I intend to share with you during today's presentation. But before we start, allow me to make a quick disclaimer. Because the subject we're about to, 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 to discuss about, it's so vast, it's so extensive. I decided not to focus necessarily on awards, because that would take us for ages, and, uh, and it would drive us all crazy, especially on a Saturday morning. So what I decided is to focus mainly on the big topics, on the big problems, the big surprises that we will, we will encounter when we face an insolvent club. So if you allow me, we will, we will proceed in that way. The first thing, I've always thought that when we're talking about insolvency, and if we were to compare it or, uh, or to describe it as if it was a Facebook status, uh, this would be definitely, it's complicated. It's no easy relationship. Because the story of insolvency and football regulations is a story of tension. A tension between different interests, both legitimate but opposing. On the one hand, it's like if you allow me, like a good uh, Colombian or Mexican telenovela, there's a lot of of passion and, and drama involved in, in this relationship. On the, one ha on the one side, we find insolvency law, the objective of which is to attain distributive justice. So in order to attain distributive justice, that is when a club goes south, it enters into financial turmoil and needs to stop and rethink its strategy, Creditors must be protected. The state must be preserved under the principle that informs insolvency law, which is the par conditio creditorum. On the other hand, we have the football regulations. Football regulations don't have as main objective to protect creditors. They aspire instead to ensure a level playing field 
between the competitors or what the Spanish doctrine, I haven't read it anywhere else, I, I only read it in the Spanish doctrine, has uh, labeled as the par condicio of the competitors. And I think we will all agree that allowing a club to compete in equal conditions, a club that has overdue payables towards all the players and clubs to compete in, um, in equal foot with all the clubs that must comply with their financial uh, obligations in order to take part in the competitions, it's to some extent against the principle of the principles of Lex Sportiva. It's not me saying this, it's the award to 646. Six. I will give you at the end of the presentation a relationship of all the awards that treat the topics we, we will discuss. But it is indeed against the principle of Lex Sportiva. It's an unfair advantage for the other club. This tension between the two, uh, the two interests of the different regulations has been addressed in certain jurisdictions. For instance, here in the Kingdom of Spain, we have the Disposición Adicional Segunda Vis in the Insolvency Law, enforced since 2011, that establishes the prevalence of sporting regulations over insolvency law when these enter into conflict. This is in place since 2011, as I said, and it shows that the Spanish legislator understood, or understood it its own way because it was not passed without uh, a lot of polemic, understood the dynamics of the sports market and accommodated insolvency law to, uh, to um, account for the specificity, the specificity of sport. But as you can imagine, excuse me, within this conundrum of, um, of diversion, laws, conflicting interests, the main problematic for uh, the FIFA legal bodies and the CAS will be to establish a hierarchy between this, this law. And, um, and so before we, let's say we cut it to the chase, uh, let's have a, a quick look at what the regulatory landscape uh, looks like. If we look at the RSTP and the procedural rules of FIFA, we have absolutely nothing. They completely ignore insolvency. And that's not per se, it's not a bad thing. I mean, the RSTP is, is, is specifically uh, in place to regulate the status of players, not the status of clubs. Its own name, uh, it defines it. Whereas if we look at the disciplinary code, we find Article 55, the closure of uh, the proceedings. This Article 55 includes letter B and allows the disciplinary committee to close cases on a discretionary basis when a party is undergoing insolvency or bankruptcy proceedings according to the respective procedures provided for by the relevant national law. This Article 55, which is an update of former Article 107, which we all know very well, when we uh, try to enforce uh, decisions, includes, seven, uh, includes several differences when compared to former 107, Article 55. First of all, it includes the word insolvency, whereas as before, if you remember, it didn't. It only talked about bankruptcy. And it also refers to uh, the importance of national uh, laws. As I mentioned to you, this is nothing new. Article 55, what does is gathers what it was already an established practice at a FIFA level. There had been some cases in the past where one of the parties relied on the literal interpretation of the case and said, no, this Article 107 is not intended for cases where the club is undergoing insolvency. It's intended for cases where it's, uh, where it's in bankruptcy. This was, uh, this was not admitted uh, neither at a FIFA level nor at CAS, so now that they updated the regulations, they decided to once and for all, uh, make it clear. What, what we also find other, uh, other uh, mentions in the, in the, let's say, in the football ecosystem regulations. We, ha we have mentions to insolvency in um, the licensing regulations. These are intended mostly to, uh, to, to, to uh, so, so that the clubs are aware when they have an ongoing concern and they have to report it in the context of licensing proceedings. But um, they are just references and, and, and definitions that are, are, are put in place to help clubs in that regard. What is the conclusion we can draw from the regulatory landscape? 
very simple, that there is no universal approach toward insolvency or bankruptcy, that it will depend exclusively on national laws. However, because insolvency laws at, a, at an international level are, are relatively uniform, we can, uh, we can somehow um, canvas uh, what situations we will, we will be referring to. So we will be referring to um, we will be referring to situations like interim measures, pre-insolvency agreements or compromises with creditors. We will be referring to insolvency proceedings where the club cannot, can no longer face its payments. It has to stop and it has to, let's say, uh, approve a reorganization plan, restructure its activity and regain financial uh, stability and credibility. And also, and also uh, bankruptcy where uh, there is nothing to do, the club, the liabilities uh, of the club uh, are much larger than their, their assets, and so the club has to be winded up, and uh, whatever it's left has to be repaid to uh, the creditors. Mm. Once we've seen the regulatory landscape, let's see what kind of disputes, let's say, are somehow incident to insolvency, or where, where insolvency can enter the scene of football-related disputes. If you read both the regulations and the jurisprudence that we have at our disposal, you will see that there are two types of disputes. On the one hand, we have contractual-related disputes, okay? And on the other, one, on the other hand, we have licensing-related disputes. These are the two big areas of uh, the regulations where insolvency will be incident. We will be focusing today, I will be focusing this presentation on the first of them, on contractual related disputes. Licensing related disputes, and I just, um, I just make this as a quick side note, they refer to the notion of overdue payables. You know that when a club goes into uh, bankruptcy or, or, or insolvency, its status changes, its capacity to pay changes. And so, the discussion at, at, an, at a licensing level will be whether once we've gone into insolvency or into uh, uh, an assimilated situation, whether the amount is overdue on or not. You have to know that most licensing regulations, both at the AFC and UEFA, provide for an autonomous definition of overdue. So as opposed to contractual related disputes, where national laws will become extremely relevant, as you will see, in licensing related disputes, the intensity of national regulations or laws on insolvency are, is, is much less, is, is, is lesser. In, um, in contractual related disputes, we have to distinguish at the same time between um, disputes relating the, during the adjudication phase, and you can find therein all the spectrum of Article 22 employment-related disputes between players and clubs, uh, coaches, uh, training uh, compensation solidarity mechanism, and, uh, and disputes be between clubs related mostly to, to transfer agreements. There is also the disputes which regard the enforcement phase. Once we have decisions, we need to enforce it. That's an, a different type of dispute. And there's a third type of disputes, which I don't mention in, this, uh, in the slide, but which are extremely interesting and important, which is a, a subcategory of of uh, contractual disputes, and they are succession of clubs related disputes, where insolvency also can become relevant. Succession related disputes can affect both at the adjudication level, when we want to get a decision from the FIFA legal bodies or from CAS, and we have to decide whether we take action against our debtor, our club, or against the newly incorporated club, but also they become incident, especially now with the approval of new Article 15.4 of the Disciplinary Code, they also become incident during the enforcement phase. Article 15.4 becomes extremely important because until now there was discrepancy at a cash level, we have contradictory awards as to whether you could enforce directly a decision against the newly incorporated club. On the one hand, we have Rangers de Talca that somehow tells us that you could potentially enforce uh, the credit against the newly incorporated club. On the other hand, we have Ivan Bolado case 
where the arbitrator said, no, you have to go back to the adjudication if you want to enforce or you think you have a credit against the newly incorporated club, you have to take the case back to the adjudication phase and get a decision and enforce it and account for the statutes of limitations, which was a big problem because, you know, proceedings lately in FIFA have not been um, particularly fast. So let's begin with uh, the adjudication phase. Before we get to the substance of the matter, before we get uh, the FIFA legal bodies are cast to tell us, yes, you're right, you, you, you have a credit against this club, which is insolvency, we need to go through preliminary procedural matters. We'll need to go through the jurisdiction. We'll need to go through the admissibility issues. And the first thing we'll need to ask ourselves is whether the FIFA legal bodies are, co are competent and whether CAS has jurisdiction. The starting point, we already know it. The regulations, the RSTP and the procedural rules, are silent. So we have two landmark awards that shifted the stance of FIFA towards insolvent case, towards cases where insolvency uh, entered the scene. These are the Lanes de Lima case against Real Betis, which, by the way, last week CAS published the second part of this award, and I recommend that you read it. And we have the Sampdoria case. These two awards mark a before and after in what it comes to uh, the stance of FIFA. Up until these two awards, up until 2011, what FIFA did, if you filed a, a claim against a club and the club alleged that it was undergoing insolvency proceedings, was that FIFA would send you an administration letter like the one we saw yesterday in Michele's presentation, saying, we're sorry, we apologize, but unfortunately, we're not in a position to deal with this issue because the club is undergoing insolvency. The reason for that, and one can understand, is the risk of lease pendants, the risk of incurring in contradictory proceedings. These two awards, however, represent a massive shift. And through these two awards, CAS tells FIFA. In insolvency, you will see, it's one of these areas where CAS speaks to FIFA a lot through awards. Uh, one would say that they, have, um, they are awards with a certain normative uh, value, and it's, and, it's, and it's true. You can hear CAS talking to FIFA when reading the awards. And what CAS said FIFA through these three awards is, says, hold on, first, think about it, think for a minute. You cannot just close cases through an administration letter. You need to decide on your own jurisdiction. It's a sufficiently important matter that you take it seriously and you decide on the first instance on jurisdiction. And when you do that, the CAS tells FIFA, consider the importance of Swiss private law on associations and whether you have a lacuna on the RSTP or not. And what is the interplay with Article 107, now 55? And more than that, when you decide, also, Think about the importance of national and insolvency laws and consider that the appellant or the claimant might be time barred from filing his claim in front of the ordinary courts. With Sampdoria, the second award in, in this slide, the cast went a little bit further because it, it was, I, I think the cast was saying, okay, FIFA is not is not dealing with it, is not coming to a conclusion. So Cass said, no, listen, I will tell you what you have to do. You have to distinguish between the recognition of a credit when you're asked solely to recognize a credit from the enforcement. So when you're asked to recognize a credit, you retain jurisdiction, you can decide on the merits. And when you're asked to enforce, because this enforcement involves the use of public powers, you have this FIFA, you have discretionary powers to discontinue disciplinary enforcement if you consider so. So the situation after these two awards, as I told you, shifted 180 degrees, and FIFA would start taking any case on insolvency regardless of the nature of credits. And one would ask himself, is this the right approach? Did Sampdoria fit all solutions? Well. We'll see about that. We'll see that it didn't. 
But uh, but the truth is now is, is that now even even today FIFA is simply taking any case uh, where he's asked only to decide on the recognition of the credit. Once we know how the jurisdiction works, the next thing we need to consider when we um, when we confront an insolvent case is what are the effects of foreign. Uh, foreign insolvency proceedings on the arbitration. Remember, we're in Switzerland. We're not in Switzerland, we're in Spain, but we're in Switzerland uh, in the context of arbitration or, uh, or quasi-arbitration proceedings. So any procedural matter will need to resort to the Private International Law Act to sort out, according to the Lex Arbitri, what is the solution. Because it happened quite often that the creditor, be it the player or the club that was willing to enforce, to get a, a decision, would say no, we tell FIFA or would tell CAS. Don't account for foreign insolvency proceedings. You have Article 166 in the Private International Law Act, according to which, in order to recognize foreign insolvency proceedings, you need to go through a recognition proceedings first. You cannot just take uh, insolvency proceedings and decide on it. What is the rationale behind Article 166? The solution came in, in the award uh, I refer to in the slide, 50-54. And the arbitrator there tells us, no, Article 166 is there because the Swiss legislator wanted to ensure that whenever a, a, a creditor wants to seize an asset in Switzerland, that at least the Swiss courts have a saying. It affects our national sovereignty. It concerns the use of public power, so I want to have a saying. The arbitrator in, uh, remember that if we look at the EU regulation on insolvency matters, it's, a, it's, it's the opposite. It's a principle of automatic recognition. In Switzerland, you need to go through this recognition because of the reason I just mentioned. In, um, in the case of war referring the screen, the arbitrator says no. When it comes to, uh, private arbitration, there is no use of public authority, the parties allowed uh, the panel to decide. Mo in most of the cases, the parties have no relation to Switzerland, and so, um, and so you can account, it doesn't say you have to, the arbitrator, it says you can account for foreign arbitration proceedings without going through the recognition proceedings. Next. Also, the, the, we, remember, we are in the adjudication phase, jurisdictional matters. What are the effects of insolvency or in the arbitration agreement? Another typical uh, argument alleged by the debtor club uh, uh, when, when the creditor is taking action in front of legal fees of bodies and cash. Now, according to my national law, insolvency law, the arbitration agreement becomes void. Since we are in Switzerland and we have to refer to the Lex Arbitris, we need to look what the private international law says. And there we find Article 178 that tells us the agreement will be valid as long as it complies to the, requir the form requirements and the substantial requirements. As simple as to the, when it comes to the form, it has to be concluded in written form, and to the substance, it has, it has to be... Um, it has, to be, um, it has to conform either to the law chosen by the parties, the law governing the dispute, the law governing the contract, or to Swiss law. It's a rule called favore validitatem, which basically, I, I would not dare that it's the cornerstone of Swiss arbitration, but it preserves Swiss arbitration. Imagine that any um, uh, debtor subject to procedure, so arbitration proceedings in Switzerland would say, no, according to international law, the arbitration Agreement. It's not so. There, there is no longer arbitration. We have two awards, 50-54, Istre, um, which I referred earlier, uh, also for the the the, the, um, the 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 previous topic we talk about. But I would encourage you, and I invite you to read the Swiss Federal Tribunal Award referred in the in the slide, the the so-called Vivendi II Award, because it delves into this matter deeply in, in the context of, of a sale and purchase agreement between a Portuguese company and a Chinese company where the Portuguese company 
invoke provisions of Portuguese national law in order to invalidate the arbitration agreement. And the Swiss Federal Tribunal jumped in and said, no, no, no. 178, the arbitration uh, agreement survives insolvency. There is nothing in Swiss law preventing the, the arbitration agreement to survive. And finally, uh, during the um, adjudication phase and the jurisdictional issues, Article 6 of the FIFA procedural rules, a source of headaches for FIFA, The so-called party requirement, you all know that according to Article 6, in order to stand in arbitration, uh, in, arbitration proceedings, in proceedings in, for, in front of the FIFA legal bodies, you need to meet the party requirement. You need to be a coach, you need to be a player, you need to be a club. Is that requirement a requirement that concerns jurisdiction or it concerns admissibility of claims? The consequences of considering one way or another are dramatic. Because if, if we consider a jurisdiction, you know that it's subject to judiciary review. If we consider it as admissibly, it is not. And there's been a lot of conflict around the nature of Article 6. Remember the Amoroso case, where the Greek club argued that the player was no longer a player, that he retired, he didn't meet the party requirement, and so the case had to be dismissed on admissibility terms. Also, the Anna Kuse case, the coach that unfortunately passed away and her daughter took over was Article 6. He didn't, she didn't meet the party requirement. Did it concern jurisdiction? Did it concern admissibility? If it's jurisdiction, it has to be analyzed at the beginning when I file the claim. If it's admissibility and it concerns the standing of the party, it has to, it has to, um, it has to exist along the proceedings. Uh, now, um, thanks to the award referred in the slide, uh, John Kingsley, Kechuk Uive against Aris, and thanks also to Amoroso case, we know that Article 6 refers to jurisdiction, and jurisdiction and the party requirement needs to be met at the beginning of the proceeding. So, if the club met the party requirement and was affiliated, for instance, when the claim started, FIFA retains jurisdiction. Are you with me or, uh, yeah? Okay, thank you, because I know it's, okay. So let's, let's move on to the next topic, admissibility. We've gone through jurisdiction, admissibility. The difference between admissibility and jurisdiction might seem obvious to all of us, but I always, um, I always remember an article I read, uh, wrote, written by Professor John Paulson for the University of Miami. It's, it's available online, it's probably you can read it. And he says that jurisdiction and admissibility are like night and day. But when it comes to arbitration, when we are in arbitration, we're most of the times in a twilight zone. We don't know what, whether we are more towards the day or more towards the night. And he proposes a very simple exercise to uh, to discern between the, the two institutions, jurisdiction and admissibility. He says, if you don't know where you are, just ask yourself, what is the reason for the outcome of the case? Why have you succeeded in raising the exception? Is it the reason for the outcome that you will not be able to submit the claim in front of another forum? Then it concerns your decision. Is it the reason of the outcome that you will be able uh, to, uh, to submit uh, the claim in front of, uh, that, that, that you will be, submit, be able to submit the claim in front of, uh, of uh, that, I'm sorry, that there, you don't have the right uh, to submit the claim in front of any other foreign, it has to be dismissed, let's say, uh, on, 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 substantial, uh, on substantial issues, then it affects admissibility. Remember, there's a, also an amazing article written by Antonio Rigozzi on doping cases. What happens if you miss the deadline? Is, is it a question of jurisdiction, ratione temporis, and then I could potentially go to state courts, or is it an, an admissibility? So the question is not, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, of polemic also uh, at a Swiss federal tribunal level, if I'm not mistaken. It's, there's not a, clear, there's, there's not a clear, clear line. So watch out, when, because the consequences I mentioned you earlier are dramatic. So the first thing uh, when it comes to admissibility, the status and the legal capacity. We'll go very fast through it because otherwise we'll run out of time. Again, we need to look at uh, the Private International Law Act. The standing, uh, the, the legal capacity, it's the existence, the existence of the club itself. Whether the club 
uh, has, um, has, uh, has capacity to be holder of rights and obligations, whether it exists. It's obvious that if the club no longer exists, it will not be able to stand in front of arbitration. So where do we have to look? We have to look at the dispositions of 155 of the private international law, and there we see that the status of a, of a company, the law applicable to the company, okay, governs its capacity and its capacity to act. So we'll need to look at the corporation law of the country of the insolvent club in order to know at what stage we are, if it still has capacity or not. Article, uh, the award 5054, which you see I recurrently uh, refer to because it's, 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 it's a rock star award when it comes to insolvency, um, um, touches upon this issue as well. Next. The standing to sue and the standing to be sued. Who is the right claimant and who is the right respondent? Insolvency produces a, 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 no, a, an impact on the status of the club. Normally, we will have other figures uh, stepping into the club and taking over certain activities. So we need to know who has the standing to be sued, who has, whether the party whether the club can avail itself to a claim, whether, whether it has, as also Miguel said yesterday, an interest worth of protection. What happens if the club is running its day-to-day -day activities, for instance, through a different company, which is the company of the judicial receiver, entrusted with you know, closing, for instance, transfer deals? Or what happens if the club goes bankrupt, disappears, is disaffiliated, and the former founding club association takes over and pretends to have rights over, let's say, training compensation. We need to account for these problems. We have two awards um, in the slide. The first is Racing Club Geno uh, against Genoa, which touches upon the issue of standing to, uh, to sue and says, well, irrespectively of whether Racing Club, according to Argentinian law, was running its activities through a newly incorporated company, the standing to sue belongs to the club because this company was acting as a sort of an agent and all contracts entered by this company accrued directly to the club, so it retains standing to sue. Very fast. Um, the standing to be sued. Who is the right respondent? Oh, again, a, a, a word 50-54. Depending on the national insolvency law, we can find that it will be the debtor, the club itself, if the national law follows a representative theory, or it can be the state itself, these are all the assets that have legal personality, that would be an organ theory, or the administrator itself, a legal successor theory. So we will need to look at the dispositions of national insolvency law, find out what is, what is who is taking that, that who is taking the standing, who has the legal capacity to stand in front of a person and address the claim against the right respondent. Maybe it's both of them, if you don't want to, but you have to account for this issue whenever you're facing an insolvent club. Finally, on the jurisdictional issue, the legal interest. If anyone can read legal interest in German, I'll buy him a drink afterwards. Okay? Um, this, uh, this, this is a word, again, 50-54, it's amazing. Why? Because the arbitrator, in this case, asks himself a question. And he asks himself the, the following question. We were in the adjudication phase. It was a player claiming against a club that had gone bankruptcy. And the arbitrator, we remember that we've seen that in the RSTP and the procedural rules, we have no, nothing about insolvency. And he said, we have Article 55 that allows the disciplinary committee to close cases. So the arbitrator goes and says, is there a way I can anticipate the effects of Article 55, he referred to 107, to the adjudication phase? Can FIFA use the prerogatives it has to close disciplinary cases in a previous stage? And he says, yes. And he finds the right legal institution to do so, legal interest. Does the claimant have a legal interest to pursue this claim? Then I can adjudicate. Is there, is there no interest at all in pursuing this claim because he, there is no way he can, uh, at a later stage, enforce 
um, the award against the insolvent, then there is no legal interest, and I can dismiss the claim on the admissibility basis because of lack of legal interest. Legal interest, the arbitrator warns us when it comes to arbitrator, the bar has to set, has to be set not too high. But in the end, it will depend to you, the claimant, to demonstrate and discharge the burden of proof as to whether you have legal interest or not. So never forget about that, because you will incur in this risk. In this case in particular, the player was claiming debts or credits in his case that were born before the entering into insolvency. So there was no way he could claim them out of the insolvency state. He had to register and negotiate these credits in a collective manner. So this is why the arbitrator came to the conclusion that it, he had no legal interest and the case could be dismissed. What is surprising about this case is that the respondent never filed an answer. So it was the arbitrator again uh, taking courage and saying, no, I'm stepping in, I, I'm, 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 uh, I'm, I'm talking to FIFA and telling FIFA that you can anticipate the effects of Article 55 to the adjudication phase. Substantial issues. We've gone through jurisdiction, we've gone through admissibility, now we get into the real fight of the case. Can a club who's undergoing insolvency invoke its own insolvency national law to terminate an employment contract with just cause or to terminate a transfer agreement with just cause? You know that most insolvency laws authorize the judicial receiver or, 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 or the debtor to terminate employment contracts when these contracts are detrimental to the club because they are a, a, an excessive burden. We have nothing in the RSTP. There's not so, mu so many uh, jurisprudence. FIFA is very reluctant to admit it as a as just cause. This I can tell you. We have specific jurisdiction in Spain. We have in particular two cases, Movilla and Sandoval against Rayo Vallecano, where state courts analyzing similar provisions in Spain tells us that you have to adopt a very restrictive approach toward these uh, termination causes. And then we have this award I'm referring to in the slide, where the discussion was not about whether there existed just cause or not. It was about a right to claim training compensation by Grenoble from Sporting Club. And Sporting was saying, no, you're not entitled to training compensation because the former club terminated the contract without just cause. And Grenoble was saying, no, the club did not terminate the contract without just cause, the employment contract with the player. It terminated on the basis of French insolvency law, and so it had just cause. And the arbitrator didn't get too deep into the matter, but he said, I'm not considering insolvency law as, uh, as just cause, because you have not demonstrated me, debtor club, that you are not at fault for the insolvency itself. You, you have not shown me that the reason why you entered into bankruptcy in this case is not imputable to you. One now wonders whether if I can demonstrate at the end of the procedure that I'm not, that the reasons for the insolvency were the circumstances of the market and not uh, my subjective fault, it would be just cause or not. The, the, this is the only, uh, let's say, hint or, 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 or trace we have or I have found in the jurisdiction. So what conclusions can we draw from the, the adjudication phase? Remember, contractual disputes, adjudication phase, jurisdiction, admissibility, substantial issues. The conclusions are the following. FIFA and CAS will be competent. CAS will have jurisdiction when he's asked to recognize a credit. We can also uh, anticipate the effects of Article 55 to the adjudication phase if we can demonstrate that as a credit a debtor club, when you're defending the insolvent club, if you can demonstrate that there is no legal interest, the claim must be dismissed on, um, on admissibility grounds. It, there won't be jurisdiction when the credit has already, uh, already been recognized and you have an enforceable deed of judgment that allows you to go directly to enforcement. National law will be crucial to determine the status, the legal capacity, and the standing to be sued and sue of the party. And national insolvency law will not necessarily entail just cause to terminate contracts. 
And finally, FIFA Disciplinary Committee will have discretionary powers to discontinue cases when the club goes into insolvency and bankruptcy. We're getting there, huh? There's not much left. Now, we've succeeded. We have a FIFA decision, we have a CAS award in our favor, recognizing our credit. Can we enforce it? How can we enforce it? We have two articles in the FIFA disciplinary code, one of which we, we, we talked about yesterday is Article 15. I'm sorry. Establishing the, it's former Article 64 in the disciplinary code, establishing the general principle according to which all decisions must be respected. Hmm? As simple as that. And then we have an exception to the general principle, if you allow me, an exception I consider, Article uh, 55, which we already know what it says. FIFA disciplinary uh, uh, committee, you can close cases whenever the club is undergoing insolvency or bankruptcy according to its national law or, attention, when you're no longer affiliated. We'll go into that a bit later. So is there the question now to answer, is FIFA obliged to enforce a credit, uh, uh, a favorable decision against an insolvent club? Obviously not. It has discretionary power. The rationale the, the CAS tells us behind Article 55 is that the objective of FIFA through the disciplinary code and the objective behind Article 15 is not to ensure the equal treatment of creditors, it's to make sure that the FIFA members and clubs comply with the decisions. So, If a club is prevented from complying with that decision because of national law, then there is no force. I cannot sanction you for that. There is no fault. Under what conditions, then, may FIFA discontinue disciplinary proceedings? When will FIFA most likely close the case? Well, we know claims before the entering into insolvency. Why? because these have to be negotiated in a collective manner under the supervision of a judicial authority, be it the judicial receiver or the syndic judge. And, I mean, there is no way I cannot sanction you if you don't have a creditor's agreement. And, uh, and so FIFA will most likely, no, will most likely, no, will close the case. We have several jurisprudence in this regard. The most clear of which to me is uh, 4162, Liga Deportiva Alajuelense. Alajuelense, it's a bit like legal interest uh, in, uh, in German. It's difficult to pronounce in Spanish. Huh? Um, when more, when claims born after the insolvency proceeding that are, can be in principle discharged against the state, okay, but before entering into insolvency, once you go from insolvency into bankruptcy, obviously all the accumulated uh, debt during the reorganization phase will regather in the insolvency and will have to be negotiated collectively as well. When else? Uh, novation of credits. This is, a, this is a fascinating topic because so far we don't have any jurisprudence. Once the credit, my credit, my right to receive one million dollars from uh, whatever club for a transfer fee. Once my credit has been reorganized, we have passed uh, a creditor's agreement and I'm entitled to receive, I don't know, 10%, 100,000 in different installments. Is the source of that obligation the FIFA decision or is it the creditor agreement? There's been an ovation of the credit. That's unquestionable. Well, in my view, we'll have to look at dispositions of national law to find out whether that novation, it's just a modification of the former credit or it's an extinct uh, no novation and it creates a different source of obligation. So watch out because, uh, because that's, a, a tricky, uh, that's a tricky discussion. And um, a, a discussion I was having yesterday with, with, uh, with Carlos, I don't know if he's here or not. But, but he, he rightly pointed out, is that creditor's agreement 
a new agreement, and then you have to go through the adjudication phase again. If your debtor does not pay you in accordance with the creditor's agreement, are you with me on this? It's a bit tricky, but, but, it's, uh, but, but it's, it's interesting. You have a creditor's agreement. We've gone through the adjudication phase. You don't respect the creditor's agreement. Do I have to start from the adjudication phase, or I can enforce it to the FIFA disciplinary condition if the innovation, if the source of obligations, it's still the FIFA decision? And finally, in cases of succession of clubs, we have Rangers de Talca award here that tells us that yes, you can enforce a, a credit uh, against uh, uh, the newly incorporated club whenever the requirements for legal succession or sporting succession of clubs are met, but you have to be diligent. You have to register your credits in front of the insolvency state of the former club as well. Because if you act negligently, you risk uh, the FIFA Disciplinary Commission um, Committee closing the case. What are the unsolved challenges? We've crossed the bridge. Uh, we, uh, we're on the other side, but we see that still some fog remains if we look through the rear view mirror. These are the, the unsolved challenges that I encourage you because I truly believe this is a fascinating topic. I encourage you to think about, to read, and to share any thoughts uh, you have on that. What are the limits of legal interest? We've seen during the adjudication phase that if we don't have a legal interest worth of protection, the claim can be dismissed from the very beginning, from the adjudication phase. What are the limits to this? What if I'm asking not only for uh, receivables that uh, must be registered within the insolvency state? What if I'm asking for compensation and I depend on a FIFA decision to acknowledge me that right to compensation? Or bonuses that have not accrued yet? Or imagine that I'm a Brazilian player or a player from Argentina or from, uh, I don't know, the island of Palau, I don't care. Any, I was about to say remote place. I'm not saying that Brazil or Argentina are remote places. For me, they are. But uh, imagine you're a foreign player, and uh, it's an insolvent, I don't know, Bulgarian club, and you've never been notified of the insolvency proceedings. Do you still have legal interest or not in that place? We don't know. We'll see. My, my opinion is that, that you have. What if, uh, is it funny? <laughs> What if, what are the effects of res judicata and lease pendants? Can the effects of res judicata, when I've registered my receivable in front of the insolvency state, my overdue payables, I'm a player, you have to pay me five salaries. I went to the judicial receiver, I registered my credits, but I'm, I'm also asking for compensation. Does res judicata affect, because I've challenged the termination of contract in front of the judicial receiver, does that imply that electa una via non dato recursus alterama, that I cannot go as well in parallel through the, the, the FIFA, let's see, avenue? Because of res judicata, I already have a decision, or lease pendants. What else? What is the duty of diligence of creditors? In the same way, we can anticipate the effects of Article 55. Remember, we can close cases if you uh, if you're in insolvency, and we can anticipate that to the adjudication phase when I'm trying to get a decision. If you can anticipate those, those effects, can we also anticipate the effects of the duty of diligence of creditors? And, and let me explain you. If you play your club that are taking action against an insolvent club, have not registered your credits in front of the insolvency state, and you've acted negligently, although you were communicated by the judicial receiver, can you still make use of the FIFA uh, avenue or CAS? If you ask me, I think the duty of diligence should also extend to the adjudication phase. We're about to finish, huh? Take, it's only two more minutes. Hang on in there. What is the nature of claims? Now imagine a sell-on clause. I transfer you a player. 
uh, for, I don't know, 300,000 euros, and I retain, as the club of origin, 50% of the next transfer. And before you sell the player, you go into bankruptcy, or you go into insolvency, reorganization. Obviously, I will not be able to receive the 300,000. I will have to register my credit into the insolvency state. But what happens with the insolvency, with the, the sell-on clause? When is the right born? Is it, condition, is it a conditional claim? Is it somehow con contingent? Do I have to register my conditional right also in the insolvency state or not? Are, are you following me? It's, it's, it, it's, it's tricky, but it, it's important. Because me, as a, as a debtor club, according to my national law, I would say, no, but you register your credit, but you forgot to register this conditional right, which, according to my national law, you have to register, so you lose also the sell-on clause. We don't know what, hap what will happen in there in CAS yet. And finally, what happens if the player becomes insolvent? Imagine that you, you have a client that has been has been condemned to pay, I don't know, 20 million euros to his former club, and you go insolvent. What happens there? We don't know. So we have exciting times ahead. Insolvency, as you can see, and you will all agree with me, and I can see it on your faces. It's a fascinating topic. And uh, just to wrap this up, I prepared you um, a slide with the current, the current situation. This is, this is FIFA against everybody with one single article. And that is Cass talking to FIFA. So uh, that would be it. Thank you for your attention. I hope it hasn't been too long. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions from you. Thank you. Gracias, eh, Josep. Pues vamos con el turno de preguntas. Espero que no haya muchas, ¿eh? <risa> por ahí a la izquierda, vamos por la primera. Buenas, en español. Ahí a la izquierda. A ver, ¿dónde? Pues podemos levantar la mano, gracias. Es que es difícil, ¿eh? Ahora, ahora, te, ahora te entiendo. Eso es... es. <risa> Como gafas de sol teníamos que estar aquí un poco. Más que, más que una pregunta, quisiera un, es que, es que no una vale. información aquí. Ah, vale, vale, vale. Hola, ¿qué tal? El, ¿Cuál es el laudo que trata sobre la sucesión de clubes? En, en el último slide verás, eh, el, el, para mí el más importante es Rangers de Talca. Hay otro que es Iván Volado, que es interesantísimo, en el que el árbitro, que es una eminencia en insolvencia, es Mark Jovel, interpretó que, um, interpretó que no puedes ejecutar una decisión de la FIFA, de un, de, de, del DRC o del Player Status Committee, no puedes ejecutarla contra el nuevo club y que tienes que empezar desde el principio, otra vez presentando un, una nueva demanda en, en, en el DRC. El artículo 15.4 es lo que decía, cambia esto. Y ahora se permite, ¿no? porque FIFA dijo, ostras, tengo dos, me imagino, ¿eh? me intento meterme en la cabeza de FIFA. Eh, no sé si fue así, pero quiero pensar que fue así. Entonces FIFA dijo, ostras, tengo eh, jurisprudencia contradictoria, por tanto voy a aclararlo en mi reglamento de una vez por todas. Es decir, sí que se puede, se puede mientras demuestras que hay una, una sucesión deportiva de clubes. Okay. No sé si he contestado tu pregunta. Sí, por sí. tanto está el Rangers de Talca y Van Volado. Okay. Están en el último slide, no sé si quieres que lo ponga en, en tal, pero sí. Gracias. ¿Alguna pregunta más? Aquí a la izquierda también. José, no me fastidies, hemos dicho que no me preguntabas. Josep, gracias por tu presentación. Gracias por tu presentación. I have to say that uh, it was the best performance on a Saturday morning in the history of Congresses, probably. So uh, I, I happened to be the counsel in the Iván Bolado case you were referring to. And uh, when I saw uh, the decision of the solo arbitrator, I felt like I was being hit by a bus, a school bus on a Sunday morning. <laughs> it was, it blew my mind, literally. So, but the, uh, the facts are a little bit different. 
a first instance, uh, a claim was dismissed, so a FIFA level, but it wasn't on grounds, on insolvency grounds or anything. It was, it was simply dismissed on other grounds. But mm -hmm. then at CAS, uh, we got a decision of favor. So in a previous CAS decision, mm -hmm. then we tried to enforce it at uh, Disco. Uh, the famous letter you also told about, we got one of those. So we decided to, uh, to resort to CAS. Uh, and then on CAS, but, but the thing is that uh, you uh, listed some instances and you said, well, this is the cases in which FIFA Disco most likely will close the case, right? Mm -hmm. Well, our, our situation was missing from that list. Why is that? Because when we started uh, the CAS proceedings to enforce uh, the, the previous CAS uh, decision, um, the club was, uh, I think, already ha had gone into insolvency proceedings, okay. but those proceedings were not over yet, okay? So the first, I mean, the club first uh, looked like it was going to take part in the proceedings, and for some reason it didn't. Um, and the thing is that when we got the credit recognized, okay, after the first mm -hmm, cut proceedings, mm -hmm. sorry, I said the second, it was the first one, so when we started the first cuts proceeding, they were insolvency. When we got the recognition of the debt, they were already uh, bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Okay, the cloud had disappeared. Yes. So that instance wasn't in your list. So the only option that I had was to uh, file a, a, a lawsuit against the new club. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the discussion. That's when uh, the solo arbitrator said, listen, maybe you have to go back to the DRC exactly. mm -hmm. and try your but, case. But now, but now with the new regulations in place, I think you will agree with me that, that that problematic is solved. You could have enforced the previous decisions against the new club. Well, I hope so, but uh, so far... <laughs> no, no, you couldn't, but you, you, you could potentially, if you would have had a decision now, do it. But the thing is that I still have a decision. I have again uh, gone to Disco. I'm still waiting on a decision from Disco. So, yeah. You have Carlos around, you can ask. Yeah, okay. Talk to him. Thank you. <laughs> No problem. Si hay alguna pregunta más, hay un par de preguntas más. Hacemos esas dos últimas preguntas. Con, con el tema de la debida diligencia, eh, vamos a, eh, te voy a, a preguntar si, cómo lo ves posible eh, esta, esta opción. Hay un equipo en Colombia que está en liquidación judicial, ordenada ya por un juez, hace cinco años. La creencia vino, fue a FIFA, uh -huh. FIFA se declaró cuando entró en, en acuerdo de reorganización, inicialmente se declaró incompetente. La, pero esa reclamación fue admitida en, la, en el proceso de, de, de reestructuración de las deudas de esos pasivos. El equipo sigue jugando como si nada y los acreedores llevan cinco años esperando la decisión, que se tome la decisión, que se formalice la liquidación del club. Hay activo suficiente para pagar esas acreencias, pero el club sigue jugando sin problema. ¿Tú crees que uno podría venir a, a, a pedir disciplinariamente? Pero es, es, ¿Tiene dimensión internacional la disputa? Claro, tuvo inicialmente, eh, la, el, el, es un jugador extranjero, varios jugadores extranjeros que están como acreedores del vale. club esperando que se liquide y que se cumpla, vale, pero ya. el club sigue jugando sin problema y la federación no toma ninguna decisión. Ahora mismo no hay ningún problema para que la FIFA decida sobre la, la, el reconocimiento de un crédito, independientemente que esté en insolvencia o no, a no ser que haya argumentos de peso… Y, por ejemplo, lo que decíamos de res judicata, es decir, si yo estoy pidiendo 10.000 dólares que me deben de mmm, cinco salarios atrasados y esos 10.000 dólares ya los tengo inscritos en la masa y están reconocidos, no hay interés legal para continuar con esa reclamación en la fase de adjudicación. ¿Me explico? Uh -huh. sí. Entonces, FIFA puede decidir, oye, mmm, case rejected. O poder reconocerlo, es decir, si, si, si considera que hay cierto interés legal, por ejemplo, si tú estás pidiendo una compensación o bonuses o no se ha comunicado, es lo que decíamos, o sea, 
There is no one solution fits all. Uh -huh. Y además, como solo tenemos un artículo, pues, eh, pues las variables son múltiples. En este caso, por lo que me dices, dependerá mucho de si lo que pides ya está reconocido por el juez síndico en el concurso o no. Porque si ya está reconocido, realmente no hay ningún interés en continuar con una reclamación ante FIFA. Okay. ¿Me explico? Sí. Tenemos una última pregunta aquí. Adelante. ¿Cuántas preguntas? Oye. La última. Yeah, hello. It's uh, concerning enforcement of a FIFA award on the sporting successor of a club. Is there a time bar within the creditor can file, can request enforcement? If, it's, if, it's, if there's a time bar, well, there, there's a statute of limitations in the disciplinary code. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what is it. You can, I mean, according to the new disciplinary court, if I'm not mistaken, it's claims you know, received or decisions received after July, after they entering into force. You cannot go that way if you have a previous decision uh, before the entering into force of the new disciplinary court. In principle, you could not, or, or maybe you could try it because you have the, the Ivan Bolado case, we, uh, the, the Ivan Bolado, the, the um, Rangers de Talca case. But uh, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, the stat, the, in the end, the disciplinary proceedings have a general status of limitations, if I'm not mistaken, of what, five, ten years, no? Depending on the infraction, five, ten years? There's people from disciplinary here, I don't know exactly. But uh, within that statute of limitation in the disciplinary code, you could potentially start enforcement proceedings at any time. And there's no need to justify it. I just, you could take your time. See? Cinco años, five years. <laughs> Thank you. Guys from disciplinary, always ready. What else? Nada más. Cerramos con esta última pregunta. Había una más por aquí, creo. No, no más. Bueno, pues lo dejamos. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a Josep.